the most dangerous area would be anything to do with the brain or the eye, the supratrochlear artery. And you can see it comes from the back of the eye. It is also connected to your ophthalmic artery and therefore to your brain. Blocking this artery is catastrophic and deep injections on the bone here are most likely to do it. The next artery along is the supraorbital artery, also emerges from the same place. So it has the same risks, but it is a smaller artery. Deep injections on the bone here would be the most risky place to inject. The next important area of depth is when treating the lateral corrugator. This is the area most linked with ileotosis, and it's all about depth. To understand this muscle, we need to understand that it runs from the periosteum medially to the dermis laterally. If you inject at the right level, you should be safe. Go underneath the muscle and the eye becomes at risk. Let's have a look underneath. Underneath orbicularis oculi, we are very close to the orbital rim, these tiny foramen and the eye itself which can lead to ileotosis and a superior rectus palsy. This is one of the worst side effects when injecting botulinum toxin, and it's caused by the needle going too deep. Probably the most common area I see new injectors make a mistake would be around the orbicularis oculi, particularly the inferior lateral part of the eye. So you only, only really need to pop the bevel of the needle in one to two millimeters, and you're right on top of the muscle. If you keep going, you actually go through the fat and the next muscle that you come to is the origin of the zygomaticus major. So this in theory can lead to a droopy smile, particularly if you're too inferior. So injecting deeply here is particularly risky for an asymmetrical smile, which is a terrible side effect. Many clinicians are trained but terrified to treat noses, and that's for good reason, the risk of blindness. The nose tip is a much lower risk area to inject compared with injecting the nasion. It's in the upper third of the nose where the dorsal nasal arteries and the supratrochlear artery may meet, allowing filler to make its way into the eye in extremely rare cases. Now, in my mind, the needle cannula choice is largely around safety. And I do believe in this area that cannula will be a safer option. So you can treat a nasolabial fold with an injection in the piriform fossa at the ala base, and you can project it forward so you have less of a shadow, but you can't do that same injection if the nasolabial fold runs all the way down to the oral commissure. So this is where a cannula becomes much more useful because I wouldn't want to stick a needle in the intermediate fatty layer of the nasolabial fold because that's where the artery tends to dip. Hopefully the facial artery is slightly lateral, but it can sometimes snake into the nasolabial fold. So it's much safer, I think, to use a cannula in this particular area. So where is the likely position of the superior labial artery? Now, the artery usually runs above or within the vermilion border. The papers that I've reviewed have described it routinely in the vermilion border or slightly above. It's usually also beneath orbicularis oris, sometimes within orbicularis oris, and occasionally on top of orbicularis oris. In fact, the ratios are about 60% of the time beneath orbicularis oris, about 35% within orbicularis oris, and 5% above. And that could actually even be in the same patient because it probably wiggles around a little bit on occasions. Uh, and of course, there are anomalous versions of this artery. In fact, when I was discussing this with Julie Horn recently, she's kindly shared an amazing video of a, an artery pulsating near the wet dry border. Now I've looked into this and actually this is a known anomaly. Back in the 70s people had discovered this and it's called a caliber persistent artery. It's essentially an anomaly at around two to three percent and and Julie actually said to me she thinks around two and fifty patients. In theory the superior labial artery is also being pulled out. You can sometimes feel it underneath or see it and it's always worth having a look. You'll sometimes see it pulsating. So when I looked into the data, I found 3% of people actually have this anomaly. So this is interesting, but it is an anomaly. The normal position of the artery, I don't believe, is at the wet-dry border, but it can be. And this is the what we all face as each time we inject. There are variations, but we're once again talking about the average position of the artery. So look now at this cross-section of a lip. This is the most important bit of anatomy that you will see. This is a histological specimen cut directly long ways across the lip and you can see where the artery tends to lie. We have the muscle that runs down the middle of the lip, anterior to that a little bit of hypodermic fat and then the dermis and on the other side you have underneath the, the muscle is where the artery usually is. As we've said it's not always at that exact point but it's usually just inferior to orbicularis oris. Now if you picture where your injection is it's on that anterior surface in most cases. Whether you're horizontal or vertical, it's, it's in, it should be on the anterior aspect of the lip. Lips should look like they are falling out of the mouth. That's actually what they are. They are actually the mouth falling out of the mouth. Evolutionarily, this is the oral mucosa that we've evolved to come out. So that's what you're trying to make it look like. So which are these vessels that are vulnerable? 
So there are really only two vessels that you're likely to hit directly in the chin. So you've got the mental artery and the submental artery. Of course, you also have the inferior labial artery, which is very nearby. But with just t just thinking purely about the chin, it really should be one of those two vessels. And particularly for augmentation of the chin, it's more the submental artery. So this artery comes, as it suggests, underneath the mandible. So the submental artery will curve round and then supplies the anterior part of the chin. Uh, but as we'll see, it's a lot more complex than that simple diagram that you see in the textbooks. So the submental artery supplies some very important structures in the neck. Now, if you think about where that artery is passing from the anterior part of the chin towards the neck and just sup superior to it are the muscles that would stabilize the floor of the mouth while you swallow. So the digastric muscle, the geniohyoid muscle, the mylohyoid muscle, and the stylohyoid muscle can all be affected. There's also, in theory, in some people, a connection, an anastomosis between the sublingual artery and the submental artery. And this is very, very important because if you are injecting with high volumes, as we do when injecting the chin, in theory, you could affect the tongue's blood supply. And this is probably one of the worst injuries because a necrotic tongue is, uh, is extremely debilitating. There's another type of danger that is down to injection technique. And, and the easiest way to avoid causing this problem is to check how much space there is before you inject. It's very similar when injecting certain chins. You'll find most patients, the tissue feels quite soft and it's easy to imagine it expanding away from the bone and leaving a better shaped chin. Whereas in some patients, you'll try and squeeze them and it simply will not move. It's really tightly adhered. If you ignore this and inject a large amount of volume, you'll find that the pressure in the chin can be so high that you get a superficial blanching. One weird side effect from this is the loss of hair in some men. You can lose part of your beard if you over project a chin. But so it's worth thinking about the complex anatomy that is, a, that is possible around here and not just thinking about the simplified versions that you see in the textbooks. So talk us through the layout of the lower face muscles. And um, that depends which part you look at. I'm talking mainly in this case with the anterior face. So the anterior face, all those muscles that control the mouth and elevate the lip and uh, and there and even move the chin are all skin to bone so, or bone to skin, depending on the way you're looking at it. Um, the muscles of mastication are a bit different. They are the classic bone to bone connections and you don't see those connections in the surface of the skin. So that's the first general layout. Uh, when we cover the fat pads, which is an another video you should have a look at, um, th this is why there's this interesting layout where the muscle and the fat pads are like tiles on a roof where they're stacked together and the deep fat pads are actually on top of other muscles. So yeah, check that video out and they'll tell you more about that. Uh, but that's the first thing that's different about the muscles in the face is that is that they don't have that classic uh, connections that the rest of the skeletal muscle does. The next thing is to think about like what, how are they actually supporting and holding the structures. And I, I kind of think about a lot of the mid face being basically hanging off the zygoma and the maxilla. So all the, all those bone, bony attachments are either on the maxilla or the zygoma, and they're hanging the, the mouth, the nose, um, the chin is all supported on those muscles anteriorly. Um, and I do kind of almost imagine it being sort of hanging there supporting but there are obviously elevators and depressors which we'll look at in detail so it's really important first of all not to get too focused on individual ligaments first but to picture the distribution of the ligaments because that really helps your understanding a lot more um, if you actually look at the distribution of the ligaments most of them fall on an angle between the lateral and the anterior face and this is the the change in the function of the face is, is overlaid by the anatomy. So as you move from being focused more on communication to focus more on mastication, that's where the line of ligaments is. So they are almost forming that boundary. So if you actually have a look at this line of ligaments, it starts really with the superior temporal septum. You then have the orbicularis oculi retaining ligament and the, in particular the lateral orbital thickening which falls on this line. You have the zygomatic cutaneous ligament. By far the strongest aspect of that is right on the angle of the zygoma on this line. Medial still to that is the longest named muscle in the body, the levator labii superioris lequinesi. And this muscle is involved also with directly elevating the lip and also the snarl expression, so pulling on your nostril, that one. So this muscle is most commonly treated specifically to stop its elevation so that the gums do not show during a smile. Uh, with an injection just lateral to the nostril. The next we have the infraorbital artery. The infraorbital artery runs through the maxilla, becoming the maxillary artery. The maxillary artery supplies the midface. A blockage to the maxillary artery would cause a nasopharynx or a soft palate necrotic injury, as well as the superficial injury to the cheek that we all expect. So never inject deeply with a needle near this foramen. 
Following on underneath that, along the master, you have the upper master cutaneous ligaments and then the mandibular septum beneath that. And onwards, finally, to meet with the mandibular cutaneous ligament. So this is the line of ligaments that holds the anterior face in place. Next muscle is on the other side of the fat pad above the buccinator muscle, and it's your rosorius muscle. This muscle is interesting because its origin is actually the surface of the master muscle, and it contributes to smiling. The main reason we come across it in medical aesthetics is actually as a side effect of treating the master muscle. We accidentally relax the rosorius muscle, and it affects the smile of a patient who wants a jawline slimming, but instead got a reduction in their smile, which is not a nice side effect at all, and it comes from hitting the origin of the rosorius muscle just where it attaches to the master muscle. And moving on down to the platysmal buns, what do we need to know about them? So this is a very superficial muscle. It's like a sheet, but then it collects into these bands um, and essentially you can relax it. It can be, it's, it's connected into the SMAS. So if you relax it, sometimes you see an improvement in jawline. So it can really make a good difference. And, and that's why it's called the, the Nefertiti lift if you do a toxin treatment is that you you create that Nefertiti type jawline uh, in a percentage of people. Um, side effects, uh, similarly actually to treating the lower face is if you occasionally I've seen a few people get asymmetry in their lower mouth and it's because the muscle isn't actually as neat as it is in the textbook and it's often woven into those depressors and you can you can sometimes see it you know the depressor angularis oris and the platysmal band are kind of woven together so occasionally get people get asymmetry when they smile I think it's when you're injecting very high up um, but it's worth knowing about.